Yo, what's up, people? It is the Solar Kid, and this is the Other Side of the Sun podcast. And today I got my man Charles Ash, all the way from South Africa, representing Durban. Awe. 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 I know you're not there. Where, where are you right now? Where do you live now? Oh, right now, um, in Northern Limpopo. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm on the farm. I moved here with, uh, to, to stay with my father. Um, my son will be joining me in a couple of months. I'm just trying to get the place ready for him because he's such a uh, demanding lighty. Yeah. So he's staying with, he's staying with my uh, in-laws at the moment. So, okay, yeah, because I remember you put a... a a post that I really found interesting. I remember reading it. Uh, it was like a long story, but I, um, it was just, it was a really interesting read, man. Uh, yeah, but, but my son's diagnosis for with autism, yeah, that was a, a life-changing. That uh, There's a couple, couple things that happened in my life that like have marked my evolution. And, you know, there's like, I can just think of like a before me and an after me for, for those in, instances. But my son's diagnosis for autism is definitely one of them. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to touch on that a little bit as well. But um, so let's just go back, man. I'm trying to remember. I can't even remember when I, when I met you because it was, I remember I was, doing, I was doing brain produce at that time with my friend Kurt. And we used to do the throw club nights. Yes. And, and all these things. But I remember my friend, a guy that you probably know, um, Bradley Stalls. He's also from Durban. Bradley Stalls. Yeah, do you know him? Yeah, wasn't he like a tra- air traffic controller or something? So yeah, well, he's the manager at, at Axe and stuff. But he yes. actually put yes. me onto, um, he put me onto Braino.com back in the day, like 99, 2000 or something. Okay. And how, obviously, and I think he said he went to school with you or you are from the same. Yes, yes, we, we studied at college together, yeah. So what kind of say, y'all know Sparks Road, say, me, I know that way there. Say. No, I'm from the Sydney. I'm from Sydney. So those are my Sydney. streets. Those are my streets. Yeah, Sydney, yeah. those are my streets. So you know, Sydney you know, Faisal and uh, all those people. I don't, they, I, don't, uh, I don't know that many people. A lot of people know me or know of me, but I, I kind of keep my, you know, I don't, I'm like a little nerd these days. Oh, for the longest time I've been, I've been a nerd. Hardly leave the, leave the pausey. I'm mean, one way on the internet, big mouth on Facebook, uh, and that's it, you know. But I you, you guys, invite to, uh, you didn't invite to Zoom XA and invite to wrap it up or Johnny's and it's a laka one to Roti and thing. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, Zoom right now. I mean, Zoom right now, my bro. But <laughs> of course, I went to those shows back in the day. But I mean, like, after you know, you get married, uh, you get lighties. You can't be in a club going back wild, you know. Even though I did try, I did try for a long time, you know, try to keep it cool. Because I got married quite young, you know. So when did you when did you come up to because um, you moved to Joburg from Dubs, isn't it? So like when did you come up? No, I was always up and down to, to Joburg. I had family in Aldo's and okay. uh, my my parents were staying in Swaziland. So we left Durban when I was eleven years old, we moved to Swaziland and then I went to school there for a year and then uh, I was up and down to Joburg to, you know, because it was just so close, so much closer than, than Durban. Durban yeah. And there was all these people traveling between the two places. So I was, I was often in Joburg. Um, but I moved to Joburg, my, you know, to start my life uh, in 99. Okay. Okay. Was that when you started? Uh, so what you studied like web development or programming or something? Yeah, yeah. I, I started out studying electronic engineering and then I dropped out and, uh, and then I did uh, IT programming. Um, yeah, high diploma so, IT. So what made you decide yeah. to start uh, Braino.com then? I mean, that, I remember it. That oh, that's uh, Braino.com. Um, I was at a flat in Rosettenville and I was, you know, a little bit out of my bracket with my brother one day. We are sitting on a little bean bag you know, pontificating with some, with some herbal products and, be, and black labels. And, uh, you know, we're like, hey, you know what, bro? Brainos don't have anything. You know what I'm saying? There's like nothing for out there for colored people. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no TV shows. There's no radio stations. There's no media. And we felt that we had something to say. And, and uh, you know, I thought there was, you know, so I, I, we came up with the idea, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do, let's do a website. So I was like, hey, I can actually do a website. That's a lucky thing. And then I remember, look, I had these, 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 there were these t-shirts that I 
all his own to make. Uh, and I thought a website would be perfect. So I can sell these things on this, on this website. It was 100% pure Brano. And this was a response to the 100% pure black uh, t-shirts that I'd seen on campus back in the day. So 100% pure Brano. Uh, I thought, let me get a website and I can start selling, uh, you know, t-shirts on, on the website. I mean, this is like 1999. Nobody, you know, nobody had internet. I was obviously way ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, I was kind <laughs> and of... And I'm thinking e-commerce. Yeah, I was kind of lucky in a sense because where I, I worked at the airport, that's how I know Brad's as well, and through family and stuff. And we had, uh, well, like, but we that, had that didn't internet. stop me from marketing aggressively, though. So I used to go to Wimmer Pen. We got this new yeah. printer from from Nashua to test at the office. You know, I was in I was in IT doing uh, systems administration, and so this new color printer. So I designed a little business card, uh, visit Breno.com, you know, uh, and I printed, I printed about 200 of these things. Yeah, you check me with a kilo team, you know, using company resources, only ducking, <laughs> like, I, I hope <laughs> I don't yeah, get caught. <laughs> <laughs> All for the hustle, bro. And then I would go to Wimmer Pen Funk uh, on a Friday, and I'm like, hey, standing outside. <laughs> You need a t-shirt you need a t-shirt you need a t-shirt and that's and that's uh it was the domain hadn't even been registered it was like uh i was running off, out of somebody's free angel fire domain dot com domains or something geo cities or something like that and then uh i eventually you know i had this this manager I, uh, and I didn't have a credit card at the time so you obviously could only register a, a, a domain with a credit card so uh I think I was 21 at the time and I was like, hey, I, let, me, let me ask my manager if he can sort of purchase this for me. So I said, hey, I want to start this, I'll start this website. Can you just, can you register? I think it was 200 Rand. I gave him the 200 Rand cash and he, he bought it and, you know, that was it. That's how Brainerd.com started. <laughs> Quite so, man. yeah. That's so and then from me, I'm like, okay, now I got it. Now what? <laughs> So now I have to teach myself how to build websites, you know, proper. Like it was, it's one thing knowing tables, cells, HTML, the little, I don't even think CSS was around at that time. Um, and then now building something that people can use. And I've actually tracked like the history of progression of, uh, you know, the websites and all the different iterations of Brainer.com that I did over the years. And as I'd learned something new, I'd implement it on Brainer.com. And that kind of like, fueled my desire to want to learn web development because I could implement these things. And, you know, then I got stuck in the open source world. You know, I started working with open source CNSs. I started learning about MySQL databases, PHP, uh, things like that. And then things just, just grew from there, yeah. No, well, I it mean, was a nice journey, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, I think everybody needs to have a passion project like that. Yeah, I mean, to put it in context for people nowadays, like, you now you just go on Wix or whatever and you just say chop, chop, chop. Even WordPress. Far cry. It's, it's a shop. far cry. Yeah, from, from where we come. <laughs> <laughs> no coding far involved, cry. nothing. You just go, you pay for it. Yeah, I know, back the then. Oh, you put the day. Hey, there you got the website. Club. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a big difference. Uh, Brain.com went through a couple of stages because, you know, I have this the idea, the very idiotic idea at the time was, Put colored people on the map. Brainer.com. We put colored people on the map. You know, that was like our value proposition. Um, and that was so I start I moved to Cape Town and you know, when I just registered the domain and I moved to Cape Town, my girlfriend got pregnant and uh you know, I was doing this internship in, in Cape Town and, and uh, I was you know to save money, I thought I'd stay with the my aunt in Lavender Hill. So I'm like, hey, uh, let me let me go and stay there. You know, I'm, she's like, hey, Charles, I stay by the flats. I'm like, how bad can it be? Okay. I'm from Durban, you know, I'm hardcore. <laughs> we we can handle anything. And I think I grew up with this very romanticized idea of, um, you know, what the what the color community was like. And in Cape Town, I actually thought they enjoyed the uh, majority status in, in 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 the Cape, but clearly they didn't. So, uh, you know, when I got there, it was just chaos and confusion. And I was like, holy sh this shit, this is bad. This is worse than I could ever imagine. <laughs> and, and I'm like, why is nobody writing about this? Why is nobody reporting about this? And then I remember that, hey, you know what? I actually do have a tool to be able to report on this. So, Brainerd.com, instead of selling T-shirts, uh, and I didn't sell a single T-shirt from the website, by the way. 
um, for obvious reasons. I think the internet penetration at, at that time was like 0.1% of the population had internet access. You had to be like a CEO or something, or the CEO, the, very few people had internet access. But a lot of people had email. So I started this email newsletter called the Braino Nation, like B-R-A-I-N-O-W. Yes, I remember I used to get that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that was the weekly newsletter. And then that, that grew. Um, I started writing. I just wrote a couple of articles about my experiences in Cape Town. I went to this, uh, the editor of uh, an online magazine at the time called World Online. And I'm like, hey, I need a, can you hook me up with a, with a column on your website? Uh, you know, this is what I want to write about, you know, and I need the exposure. What is what like, yeah, sure, give me a couple of articles. Boom, he had about six articles in his inbox. And he's like, okay, short, let's do it. Coming for a photo shoot. So I came in for a photo shoot and I'm like, mm, you know, was, and then that's how Play Noco kind of, kind of grew. Uh, cool, just me man. writing about my experiences in Cape Town. I think that's, that's, that's really cool because you're originally from Durban, Swaziland, you got Joburg in there and then going to Cape Town as well. So you're getting a full mix of like, you know, what the Breno is. So yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Just to obviously, I mean, I've said it a few times on the podcast, but like, obviously I've got the international uh, viewer, you know, international viewers. So like, for those who don't know, colored people in South Africa or Brainos or Bushies or Bushmen or whatever they decide to call us, are uh, these group of, I would say, so-called colored, because we were called that and given that name by our oppressors and put into this group of basically people who are mixed from Asian, African, European backgrounds and just labeled as colored. And then we kind of developed over, was it to say 200, 300 years or so? More, uh, yeah, yeah from, I think from the, from the arrival of Jan van Riebeck, you can about actually- About 1600s or so, yeah. Yeah, 1654, I think they're about. So you got um, to see a good, and obviously between Cape Town, Joburg, Durban, there's even different accents. There's like- Oh yeah, absolutely. You know I mean, I think I think a lot of people uh, like when I started off on on the journey with Brainer.com, uh, I definitely have evolved my my ideology, my thinking, the you know my just my my understanding of of society, and and I must I'm very grateful for that experience. You know that I was uh, I had this this project that that was quite visible at the time, and people were very emotionally attached to it. Um, so I felt a really really strong sense of responsibility that I didn't want to you know, make colored people look worse than they already look. So I try to keep a very high quality standard in terms of the content, the content that I put out, the articles we wrote about. Um, it all, and it all came at great cost, you know, to, to be writing, uh, paying graphic designers, and, you know, uh, getting content written. And it was just a lot of work. And I remember in the early days with my yellow stiffy, because uh, I didn't have internet at home. Um, so I'd, have, I'd, I'd I'd go to the office early, so I'd spend my my evenings writing content, writing articles, and updating the websites, and you know, doing my HTML all in Notepad. <laughs> and I'm like, it? and then I'll save it all on the stuffy desk, and then I'll go to work early so that I can upload it and you know, send my newsletter and and that. So it was it was a, a different time. But I I think with with regards to to the way I see colored people now, um, I identify uh, and I encourage most colored people to do this as politically black, socially colored. Yeah. Uh, because we cannot deny the fact that apartheid uh, and colonialism has uh, shaped this particular group of people. And, you know, culture is a very fluid thing. You cannot deny that the colored community has a definitive culture, uh, a way of being, uh, you know, way of, of behaving uh, and, and it's very discernible and distinguishable in, in society. So my social identity is colored because there's not, that is what it is. You know, there's, there's whether it's right or wrong is, is not up to anybody to decide. I embrace that identity and that's, and that's what it is. And that's where it ends. The discussion's over for me. Uh, it's not up to you to uh, harangue and, and uh, you know, beat me over the head about, oh, but that's what the identity they gave you. I don't care. You know, they give anybody, any group of people, all sorts of identities. And identity is a fluid thing. You know, uh, culture is a fluid thing. So from when I, when I think about how I started out thinking of colored people, I thought that colored people was, colored was like a physical reality, that it was like, you know, gravity, electromagnetism, it was a physical thing that, uh, you know, colored people were as much a part of uh, like a, a reality of, of uh, society as blackness and whiteness. Uh, and, you know, I've my thinking quite, quite substantially. No, no, yeah, I, understand. 
No, I mean, like, I, I've always, well, not always, but, like, when I was younger, I was a, I was a, a performance poet. That's why I started there. So, like, yeah. I started reading Steve Biko and Kwame Nkrumah, and I became very pan-Africanist. So, like, I identified myself in terms of Black um, liberation and, you know, the Black struggle and, yeah, like, yeah. you know what I mean? As a Black person. And then, I mean, like, but like you say, socially, we are colored. But now, being in the UK or in the rest of the world, it's a very derogatory term. And I mean, I learned that very early on when I came here. It's like, yeah, yeah. like, well, like, what do you, would you look me like for me, especially because I'm so light skinned, people can't really tell, yes. you know, and then they see a bit of Afro hair and Chinese eyes and they're like, oh, what the hell? What is this? Like, yeah. You know, and then I'm like, well, I'm colored. And then if you, especially if you tell now a black person, they're like, what? You can't say that. You know, and then it's like, what the hell? So you have to kind of like be sensitive to how you actually, yeah, yeah. you know, identify yourself. And I mean, for me, I have a very idealistic view of the world in terms of like, I view us as earthlings because I love aliens and all that type of shit. Like yes. for us, we are human race, you know what I mean? But then to try and tell that to someone who's very involved in their culture and their identity and whatever, it's like... No, I, 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 I'm also, I also subscribe to that, that uh, view of, of society as that fundamentally we're all humans and all of the challenges we face, like we live on a common planet with common in, a common environment, you know, common uh, earthly resources. Um, so obviously we have a common destiny and so it's imperative on us to get over our, you know, legacy existential uh, challenges and, and uh, disputes and, and just find some, some kind of way to, to work towards that. But for as long as uh, or, or, or while uh, identity has, uh, you know, an ability to allow people to access resources, then identity is important and if we live in a country where your resource allocation or your community's ability to access resources is dictated by uh, your community's ability to articulate its position or to articulate its culture or, or to have its voice heard and so because Kali people haven't learned you know that yet we, the, we're still uh, mired with quite a, a shameful uh, identity that we feel quite ashamed of and that's why we you don't see I'm a so-called Indian person I'm a so-called uh, white person so-called black person these are all social constructs all of them but yeah. when it comes to Khaled you know we we we, we do that and, and and so forth and we we don't have a fully constituted uh sense of self and and that manifests itself in in many ways you know and speaks to the many unique uh challenges that the color community faces you know more most more than any other group in, in south africa so i i you know for me to get over that hurdle uh politically black socially colored they're not in dispute there's no in, you know conflict for you know between and coloredness it's just like I, I i view colored as a as a like a subset of it's obviously a subset of black uh but like a tribe of black you know like a diff, that was just socialized differently and now has these particular uh broad characteristics and uh, mannerisms and attitudes <laughs> and social mores and norms that, that define this group and so yeah no for sure man one that's, thing i liked that's, about that's um, what it is about Braino.com was that it, it sort of started to create like a unity across the, um, you know, like a national unity because like in Joburg, we never really referred to ourselves as Brainos. We would say Bushy, you know, yes. in, um, in, in Cape Town. I don't know what they would say. Well, I don't think they say They that. say Braino. Well, they say Braino. They say Braino. Well. Yeah. So like for me, like that's why we, when we started our thing, we called ourselves Brain Produce because we thought, okay, we wow. like, you know, continuing with this whole thing and like me, I love Durban. Durban is one of my favorite places in the world, you know what I mean? So I've always had a few of it. Yeah, I'd love to move back there. But yeah, um, yeah, man, I really, I really like that. And as, um, especially with, with Braino. So like, are you still doing it? Or like, is there any... Um, I don't have the same passion that I have for it. It's not being been run by uh, Ryan Swano. I mean, he kind of took over the cudgel. For me, uh, when after we, you know, Color TV was was aired on, on TV, that was kind of like, for me, my stake in the ground. And it's like, okay, my time to tap out. Because my, when Color I set TV. up it, yeah, we did a TV show called Color TV. Um, I don't know if you've heard about that. No, I didn't actually. 2012, they're about, um, and we just did one season. It was a you know one hour show. Came on every Friday. Took the place of Word for Word. It was pretty popular. Yeah. 
Yeah, we got a. I, it was it was such a long journey to get there, though. We, it, it took so much of my life energy uh, out of me just just to get that little token prize, um, because it's just a. First, it was a battle to convince the colored community that media is important, uh, and that without media we are invisible. So I started the strategy after my son was diagnosed with with autism, and you know they said he, he was he'll never speak, he'll never understand communication. Um, so you, you'll have the IQ of an 18 month old for the rest of his life. Uh, and he's 16 years old now, big boy. He still can't speak. And they were right, um, you know, that, that he, he still cannot communicate. But it just like now living in that environment now, you know, I've got, I've got a daughter. Uh, you know, she's 19 now, but she was, also, she was always very talkative and, uh, you know, very high, uh, what, what, neurotypical, you know, like that's, that's what they in the autism community call like the normal brain. Um, so she was neurotypical and so, she, you know, it, it just having that one child that you can't speak to, that you can't reach, my household was utterly dysfunctional. Uh, I won't lie. It was difficult. It was, uh, you know, it was frustrating, uh, but it, it did bring home the point to me that if South, South, South Africa is a society of races, um, media is the cornerstone of the modern economy. And we've got a child in South Africa that uh, is unable to speak, is denied a voice, is denied an opportunity to speak, um, then we don't have a normal, uh, you know, economy. You know what I'm saying? And this 9% of the population that's colored, uh, that, that is not taking part in the media economy, then we're operating our economy at like 91% efficiency when it should be 100% efficiency. Uh, because you're not harnessing this group's latest economic societal worth you know, for, for legacy, uh, mean, reasons or whatever informs that uh, justice. The, the rationale behind that became very clear when my son was diagnosed with, with autism. So uh, it became like a bit of a crusade, actually, for me to so uh, tell, me, tell me about that you know, get media so for, like, for the colored community. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, um, it was just... Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me let me let, let me let, let me tell you about that, right? So so first it was like the realization that okay, what is because that was like a common problem on the forums and in the chat rooms on Brain.com. Okay, what's the actual problem with color the color community? Why is the color community? Why does it have the, the highest rate of incarceration, highest rate of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, violence, gangsterism, uh, and so on? You know, what are the why is this community so anomalously afflicted with, with all these negative things? Um, why is nobody talking about it? why are we not making any progress? And then if you just drill a little bit deeper, you'll see that uh, the SABC doesn't even have a policy with which to address colored people. They never have, and they still do not uh, to, to this day. And so for me, that was a big problem. How can you have a group that exists on the census forms, that exists legislatively, uh, that exists in every definition and in every facet of uh, you know, South African society, but they are denied equal access to state resources? And for me, that was like a, a derailment of, of justice. Like, this is, this is the problem. Um, so for me, the question about what is a colored, who is a colored was never an issue for me. That was like a, a side issue um, because I felt that it was a, the, the, the point was moot. I don't need to argue the existence of colored or non-existence of colored. Colored already baked into the, the gazette. They already baked into the legislation. We exist as a facet of South African society, whether you like it or not. So the onus is not on me to prove worthiness and jump, to run your obstacle course and, you know, uh, jump up and show you do this dance and show you know when uh, what what uh, uh, no that's not gonna happen i'm a color i'm i'm a, i'm a colored but i from this community that is currently in deep shit and uh, we are denied uh, the, the media means with which to have a conversation with ourselves so uh obviously we are stunted our development is stunted in, in the new south africa we are not experiencing the fullness of our constitutional rights mm -hmm. so i try to convince people about this that hey we need to start uh um, you know, getting media. And from another thing was that I, as, as busy as the website was, I mean, Brainer.com in its, in its heyday, you used to get like 13, 14,000 unique visitors per day. Um, I had to get a dedicated server, you know, it was, it was expensive, you know, um, getting all these things running. And that's the yeah, and then I had to get a dedicated that. database server. Exactly, bro. Yeah, we took yeah. like 2005. That was like the busiest yeah, time, you know, there was like four. 13, 14,000 unique visitors per day. It was really bumping, you know, and, and uh, it was so 
I, I could never get a corporate sponsor. I would approach corporations and they'd be like, ah, no, you're, you know, colored people. Yeah, it's racist, it's racist, it's racist. But if you, they, but you listen to the radio on Lotus FM and you hear ads specifically aimed at Indian people. You listen to Ukwezi FM and you hear ads specifically aimed at, 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 at Zulu people. Amungana uh, Lonene, you hear ads for Tsonga people. Why wasn't there any uh, attempt to create ads to target this, communi this community in South Africa? And so I thought that by tackling this issue by, by trying to get a national radio station, an FM radio station for the colored community, um, that I'd be able to legitimize colored people at a corporate level, because now the SABC has now relented and they've, uh, you know, made amends and they've, you know, started uh, this, this uh, platform, you know, they've, they've started giving colored people uh, SABC media. Um, and so that was the, the, the strategy that I was going on, that uh, let me legitimize the color community by getting the SABC to provide state media. And then once you've got that, then corporations are going to be forced to step in, to, to come to the party and actually create content and things like that for, for the color community. So it was about legitimizing the color community. That was the broader, uh, you know, sub, subtext of, of the, 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 the fight. Because I felt that this could unlock more value and opportunity. Because also used to send me their, their CDs and their demos. And back in the day, I don't know, you, 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 your heart bleeds because it's like, what can I do for this? So, you know, I can give him a, a you know, put a press release up on, on brain.com, write a little review and, or something. But he needs something more, this all needs something more sustainable. He needs a, a radio airtime. He needs gigs. He needs things like that. Uh, and, and, and so it became quite a personal thing that, you know, that this was, this was the mission. Um, and I was always reminded of it, you know, when I went home and, you know, I can't talk to my son and I feel, uh, so frustrated and, and like, you know, this is, this is not what life is about. Um, and, and so that, that was the, the, the crusade for, for brainer.com. So first he was convincing people that, that we needed the media. Um, then it was starting a group, uh, to, to actually take this forward. I met a guy by the name of of um, Ronald Dyers, and he he really ran with it. You know, he you know he had all the necessary skills. Bro, I'm an, I was a nerd. You know what I'm saying? I, I've, I've got no union skills. I've got no organizational skills. I've got nothing. I, I'm happy behind a computer. You know, in private, far away, mm -hmm. home typing. Uh, and so Ronald, like he he sets up all the necessary uh, uh, organizational structures. We set up this, this group called Same. The South African Movement for Equality, and we started lobbying the SABC. Uh, we had a couple of meetings with them. We uh, we eventually settled out of court. It took many years for for us to actually make some progress, but uh, by the by the end of it, we, we ended up getting. I met another guy by the name of Bernie Baichis. Uh, you know, I don't know if you watch Dollars and White Pipes. Yeah, but yeah. that's that's the movie of his life. And Bernie yeah. was just returning from uh, Thailand. He had an idea for a TV show. He contacted me, and and he said, and I said, yeah, you know, we we actually talking to the SABC. Uh, we need some ideas for content, you know, to actually put some things, put a solid proposal together and, and say, okay, why don't you fund this? Uh, and then we eventually did that. And, and they, they, you know, uh, we eventually got the funding and we did a season, one season of, of Color TV. How come we only lasted one season? That sounds awesome, bro. For it, to just like... it is, it was. It did, it, it did start like, I mean, now people see a much more vibrant media ecosystem for the colored community, but it was way, way different, you know, earlier on. I mean, talking colored to topics was taboo. It was just, it yeah, was so, you know, like, I, people... That's something, that's something that I used to fight with my family. I mean, the first thing, like, especially in Joburg, was, like, anytime you heard a colored accent on TV or the radio, your parents or whatever would be like, yeah, that's it, you know, like, we couldn't even, con like, we couldn't even palette our own tongue the way we yes speak. because we were so unfamiliar to it you know it was just it sounded foreign yeah that's what i'm saying it's like but this is how we all speak you know what i mean and yet when you hear someone on the radio yes. on tv talking like it's like, oh yeah it sounds so coarse or whatever and stuff yes but, yes yeah. and, but i mean and but it has been slowly been normalized right and i must commend groups like uh you know Sheld like sheldon ferris and l'oreal ferris and, and uh uh you know malcolm bass and them for for doing aldo's fm and yeah i mean and there were a couple big. Yeah, they just speak. took I off. Mean, and, my, my family have all been sending me stuff and saying like, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, man, it's about time. Yeah, that's, so I, I'm glad that that's happened and people have, have, have you know, risen to the challenge and, and they've, they've uh, filled the, the, the gaps in the, in the, in the ecosystem in the, with their own unique uh, flair and flavor. And it's, I think it's, there's, there's so much more potential. Well. There's coffee for now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's good, man. And I mean, I see loads of Facebook groups. And, there's I mean, even, yesterday's, yesterday's got, got its own radio station. 
so and it's, it's, uh, it, as well the the t-shirts and all that stuff yeah we know that 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 really helps us the, the, the branding the t-shirts the events that we used to have back in the day um uh, in well, i mean color the brand as well like there's a brand called oh yeah 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 okay oh yeah that, that's ronald that's ronald dyers that's ronald okay. dyers yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so cool. he wanted to start something with Afrikaans and I was like, you know what, I, I can't add any value because, you know, the Afrikaans is practically non-existent. Uh, Durbanites. Durbanites, yeah. And, and so he's, he's like, okay, he wanted, to be, he wanted to start his own thing. I'm like, yeah, hey, by all means, go for it. You know, let's, the more, let's make this ecosystem as vibrant as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, for me, it was like, you know, let's, let's, let's share. Let's, let's get everybody involved. Yeah, because um, we did a show in 2000 and nine i think it was we had our first like the first hip-hop show near bossmont we you had the stadium we had all these rappers and stuff so we were starting to create platforms and like just trying to yes 100 percent. yeah but at that time like i i i was i was like on the verge of tapping out like just you know been through business liquidations and uh your cars getting repossessed and oh just went through a separation with my wife and and it was just a a difficult time yeah Uh, I was just going to say, so you I mean, you had all that and whatever, and your son, I mean, tell me about that, like with your, your son and dealing with all that and, you know, it must have been heavy. But... Um, yeah, it was dealing with autism. It's, it's actually the name of this uh, uh, show that I wanted to do. So a couple of years back or four years ago, I decided, okay, I'm going to take all these, these lessons I've learned about autism and all these things that I've learned. And, you know, I, I, was, I was trying to do, I was dabbling in comedy at the time. Um, you know, I just found it such a therapeutic outlet for me. I had so much to write, so much to say, but I couldn't say it as Charles Ash of Brainer.com because I kind of positioned myself in a particular way as this quasi academic type, uh, you know, and I couldn't be like the normal, you know, garden variety, you know, Brainer that, that I actually am. Uh, and so, on stage, I could be somebody else, and I, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but you know, comedy didn't fly. There was always something that that would prevent me from from you know getting into a routine, going uh, getting more mic time, getting going to gigs more often. Uh, you know, because my well, I was the only only one that was working in my in my family. You know, my uh, my wife uh, didn't work because she had to look after Cody. You know, full time. That was our our arrangement that she'd stay at home and she'd look after the kids. She'd look after Cody. And you know, she did try, you know, trying to start different internet businesses and things like that. Uh, but it, it wasn't, you know, a stable income. So everything fell on my shoulders, you know what I'm saying? And so you, you can't just uh, throw caution to the wind. And as much as I felt like I'm such an entrepreneur, oh, I've got to start my own business. You really can't take too many risks, but it didn't stop me. I mean, I'd, I'd always, uh, I'd, I had the cycle of, you know, uh, get a job uh, so I can just you know, lick my wounds and then uh, save up some money after a year, leave that job, plan my, then go into a start a business or something. And then I'd ride that for like maybe six months to a year. And it, that when that invariably fails, then I'll, you know, we'll get on the CV, the hunt again, you know, get a job and so on. And, and that was kind of my cycle very, very often. So I'd always try to get jobs that would allow me like flexibility to, to be able to do my thing on my own thing on the side. Um, but juggling all that and then trying to do comedy at the same time, uh, it was it was quite difficult and and so I, my comedy just just never really took off and uh, you know it's, it's it is what it is and you you got to put in work in, to to make it in, in anything and oh, I course. absolutely was not so I I did try to write a sh- a show called dealing with autism um, so I contacted the autism South Africa and I'm like hey check I got this idea for a a road show that we can do to raise funds and raise awareness about autism. Um, you know, if you guys can sponsor it uh, and become my, my partner in this, then I'll write the show to be a one hour show. You know, we can go around to, to different corporations and, and teach people about autism. Uh, and then I just talk about my unique story about how, I, uh, you know, how autism has affected me and, and you know, relate how I related to, to the colored community and the importance of media, the importance of a voice, the importance of speaking out and, and you know, it was, so the, the whole idea was for it to be like very triumphant and, and, you know, feel good and, and uh, you know, like take people on a journey and, and, you know, a lot of music and hip hop and things like that. Uh, and so they were like, yeah, look, look let's do it. So uh, I packed up, I was like, hey, look, I can't do this and still work. Uh, so my wife agreed that hey, let's, let's move to, to my dad's place in, in Limpopo. 
um, you know, he had a, a spare outbuilding here. And so we're like, yeah, let's do that. And then I'll just need four months, Renee, four months. And then, you know, I'll be able to write this show and I'll be able to go back and we'll, we'll kill it. You know, I'll just get bookings and it'll work. And so I, that, that's what I, I, I set out to do. So we packed up uh, our house in Centurion. You know, I, I left, left work uh, and we moved here. And then we were here. When did we get here? April 2017. Uh, my wife passed away on the 6th of August, 2017. Oh, so, yeah. so as we got here and I'd started writing, I think I'm still on like uh, 32 pages of, of that particular thing. Uh, but yeah, she, she, con she got pancreatitis and then yeah, just complained about a stomachache the one day and then uh, she got rushed to hospital intensive care. She never came out two weeks later. She was, what? She, wow. she passed away. Wow. So that was also a, hell of a thing um oh. so then now, now i'm stuck dealing with the you know with a big 14 year old autistic lighty ah but you know with no job now, now i have to go back to uh to reality my daughter doesn't want to speak to me because she hates the, the farm you know she didn't like it she was against it um so it was you know trying to now get a relationship going with her and she was not interested so she was staying with a friend of mine in in Pretoria, a family friend uh his daughter was in a class and you know they were quite instrumental in, in helping us uh you know through that period in our in our lives um and then my son went to stay after the funeral my son went to stay with uh, my wife's parents in durban and then i went to you know i went moved to florida to uh you know my wife's uh, nephew uh, he had a he had a flat and he had a couch and so I'm like hey uh, Melvin can I sleep on your couch please bro I need to find my feet um, and so that's how I kind of rebooted because I'd left yeah I had, I had absolutely nothing when I moved back so it was now the rebuild and uh, yeah I'm I'm much much further down the road than I was then I think maturity helps um, but yeah it was it was a it was a it was a climb to to get back to where I'm at now um, and now now I'm starting to you know reactivate certain things um yeah no, things, I things imagine, bro, like, when things like that happen you just have to put things on hold and just deal with yeah them. oh bro it was like it was it took it, like i think the first like, like i almost committed suicide uh i'm lucky to be alive actually um because it just got so bad like i was staying with my with my uncle in, uh you know after i'd stayed at in, in florida and sleeping on my on, on my nephew's couch uh, then, you know, I got a job and, uh, you know, moved to, uh, uh, to Pretoria. My uncle had an outbuilding, so I'm in the outbuilding. And so, but like, because I didn't leave the house and, and like you're alone with your thoughts and, and nobody visits you, uh, you know, and, and you just, you feel like you, you isolated and left from the world and you're suffering with, I was suffering with severe depression. And so I thought, okay, this is it, you know, what value am I adding to this world? You know, I convinced myself that the world would be better off without me. Um, you know, my daughter hadn't spoken to me since the funeral. This was like seven months on. Um, you know, my son obviously couldn't talk to me. Uh, you, know, you know, and now my, my wife's parents are complaining, oh, you know, that, that he's, he's a handful and, and they're struggling with him. And so I, I just felt like my back's against the wall. And, and, you know, this is, so I hung up a noose and, you know, try to, Wow. That luckily I'm fat and the thing broke. So. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> so yeah. Damn, bro. Give thanks, um, man. Give thanks. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be alive. I'll be honest, and I just think that now I'm in a different chapter of my life now. Um, you know, my daughter's doing well. She's at varsity. Uh, you know, my son is doing well. He's coming to stay with me, and so I'm just busy getting a place ready for him. Uh, you're talking to your daughter you know, again and stuff. Oh yeah, no, her and I are homies now. We are the homies. So no, she stayed with me all of last year, all of matric. So you know, I was like a coach. I was like Coach Carter. <laughs> like you know, she was like the like a, I was like a drill sergeant for you. Claude, these A's are not gonna get themselves. Claude, these A's are not gonna get themselves. You gotta work, but I so. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, I mean, through, through she, she, that. she did pretty well. You know, she did really well in her She got five A's, and you know, she's studying. Well, she didn't get into medicine, but she's doing BSc medical bioscience, and I'm very proud of her. Nice, I can imagine, bro. I mean, through all of these things, like this is like one hell of a story. So, like, do you? Are you religious? Are you spiritual? I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. Okay. 
So how do you relate um, these things to life? I used to be Christian. I, I used to be very, very religious at one time. In fact, being atheist is really uh, accepting for what they are. Um, that Look, obviously, there is extra anguish in death because as an atheist, I don't believe in an afterlife. Um, you know, there's just no evidence for it. Uh, so death is very final. Um, so I try to live a life of meaning and, and it's really given me a desire to want to, when I die, people must remember the things that I did and, and, you know, the things that I did must actually live, outlive me, you know, the structures that I've put in place and the things I've done and made and created. And, and that's kind of how you live on. That's your, that's your real life, um, in, in, in my view. Uh, but I do try to immerse myself more in, you know, the, the day-to-day -day things like, conversations with people, I appreciate people more, family more, friends more, conversations more. I, I got, I've got low patience for, for, for small talk and idiotic things that are argumentative and, and, and just silly. Um, you know, I laugh harder now. I drink more, you know, I, just because, I, you know, when I do, you know, when you, if you're working, if I'm going to work, boom, you know, work hard, play hard. And when I'm playing, I'm going all in. Um, you know, but when I'm working, I'm going all in, you know, this, this is not a game. Uh, and so it's kind of given me, it's kind of given me that, that perspective that I don't take anything for granted. I don't do anything wrong to people. I try to live a very a highly ethical life uh, because, you know, I don't want anybody doing anything wrong to me. So I would never do anything wrong to anybody. And uh, you wouldn't so I just say that. To live my life. So that's, is that completely based on ethics and not karma or yeah. like, Ethics. It's, it's purely ethics. ethics. I, I don't believe in karma. In fact, I, my wife was the biggest Christian. She was a much bigger Christian than me. So if, if this God was proving something, why is he killing my wife? You know, believed in him and, and went to church on the regular. Uh, so it just... But I mean, I suppose you could argue that nobody knows when, you know... It doesn't make sense. I would be a much better token. You know, religion is, is another thing. I think the Kali a common voice because the, the, the Kali community is uniquely split along three religious lines. It's like your traditional Christians, like, you know, your, your Anglicans and Catholics. Then it's your born again Christians that are, you know, those are the most vocal ones. And then it's the Muslims, you know, which are also staunch in your belief. And sometimes you can have all three in the same family at a family gathering and they're all brothers and sisters, but hey, that one's Muslim, that one's hardcore safe, that one's got the top, okay? And then you come in here, bro, and now you're atheist. Well, I get kicked out, I get kicked I yeah, get kicked out of family functions like, on the radio. Yeah, right? they must be thinking you're a devil worshipper or something. Yeah, no, they right? do, they do, they do. <laughs> but I let, I let, people must judge me by my actions, you know, don't, don't judge me by what you think, you know. Judge me by, by what you see me do. And, and Yeah, you know, because that name, atheism, is was, it's somehow synonymous with, like, worshipping the devil. For the something. devil, yeah. I don't know yeah, why. It is. But it's, it's just that I, don't believe, I believe in one God less than you. If you believe in God, I believe in one God less than you, you know. Exactly. You don't do believe... You actually, how did you come to um, like, did, you did I come to atheism? That was also quite a journey, but it was uh, many fear. That's actually a very in interesting story. Uh, I was very staunchly Christian. I was in like Teens for Christ and Youth for Christ and whatnot. I had DC Talk posters in my room and used to get their tapes, DC Talk. And I even can even rap their songs still. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I, it was... My, the first time I met a, a, an atheist was in school in Swaziland. I went to this international school for one year, my brother and I, and it was a very transformative experience. So we got to meet this uh, uh, teacher and he was an atheist. And I was like, what? How do you not believe in God? Are you mad? <laughs> and so he was the, 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 the board rule, you know, the, the, the boarding headmaster. And like, you know, uh, I, I used to try to convince him every uh, every night when he's coming to put lights out, no, oh, but Mr. Williams, you got it. And he's like, and he's like really calm and casual. And he's like, Charles, go up and read on this. So yeah, and that old dad, you know, plays Pascal and Pascal's wager. So that next day I'm in the library. I'm like, I'm cool. I got for you, Mr. Williams. And I've got my pen and paper there and I'm taking notes. And, and then I'll, I'll back and forth. Eventually he used, he planted such good thought provoking questions in my brain that I couldn't find an answer answer for and at the time you know puberty was hitting and uh fear was a big thing i'd grown up on a diet of uh, uh you know i started school when i was four of, years old the right? wrath of god 
<laughs> I started exactly, you know, with the horror movies, watching, uh, you know, Freddy Krueger and, and Damien and, and, you know, so you like, you, you're scared of the supernatural, like, you know, you're scared of things, they like, you're living in this world of ghosts and the unseen and there's dark forces and everything and the evil and uh, people can do voodoo and, you know, muti and whatever and they, oh, now you, you, you're just so vulnerable out there and so, <laughs> If, I, the world was too chaotic. I had such an overactive imagination. I was terrified. I even remember when I was like, you know, 10, 11, 10, 11 years old, bed wetting. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, got the bed, you got, got the duvet here. And I'm like, okay, I want to go to the toilet. But uh, what if a demon grabs me yeah. from under the bed? And then, you know what? I'm just going to have this warm pee right now. Oh, I'm really <laughs> so. And the option was, you know, to actually go to the toilet uh, and, and overcome your fear. So it was a lot. Of, a, 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 I feel very liberated from fear. I felt very liberated from fear when I became an atheist because now there was no devil. There was no God. There were no demons. There were no ghosts. It was just objective reality, the things that I could see and observe and, and, and you know, uh, could measure and, and, and uh so once I, I became an atheist, uh, I remember it was like a, a, a light switch turned on, you know, and I wasn't afraid of the dark. I became quite fearless, actually, about about things. No, and I think I, I can I can actually relate to that because in a way, I kind of, I mean, I was similar to you. I was very like in, involved in Christian stuff and whatever. And then like, funny enough, I was actually on acid. I took acid like. <laughs> Woo, check you. <laughs> Hey, bro, this, this thing, like, I came, and I was just like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Because then I got involved in the heavy, like, born again, Rayma, what, what, what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not me. And literally on the same thing about fear, that started my process of discovery. Then I started reading up on Rastafarianism, Taoism, Judaism, Islam. Yeah. And just going through, and I must have been on that. I mean, I still am on that journey, and I've been doing that for, like, the last 15 years or so, just reading and finding yeah. out. And in the same sense where you lost that fear, I've been losing mine more to Eastern mysticism and Eastern religion and stuff like that. It's not to say that all these scriptures and texts and whatever are, you know, like how our people or some people, especially Christians, they take it so literally. It's like, no, you must do this because so and so, or otherwise you go into hell kind of thing. Yes, you know what I mean? yes. For me, it's poetry and it's inspiration. So like, through reading and understanding and actually delving deep into like Eastern mysticism, that fear is also dissipating and has dissipated. And I'm getting to that point where I feel like, you know, um, you know, I don't need to be scared about bloody ghosts and demons in the dark. And yeah. And, it's the, and, and I mean, I do respect that the body of, uh, of knowledge that is, uh, uh, or creative output that is Christianity or scriptures and, and, uh, it is very creatively written and it is very well written and, uh, it is testament to to just the, the power of of, of thought and and how what the human brain can can accomplish given enough time and and, and enough people collaborating. So I, I don't take anything away from the the value and the intellectual worth and, and the creative worth of, of of these scriptures. I just don't think that it has any bearing on uh, on reality and and uh, you know objective reality. And so. Our world, if we look at it now, we be, we be, we becoming anti scientific, and, and we we are reverting to these uh, you know uh, magical beliefs and, and magical thinking. Like, are we going to pray to the sky and this is going to change and that's going to happen? And and I, it just doesn't work out like that. It just doesn't happen like that. You know, this world is cause and effect. You know, what are you doing? Uh, you know, to to cause that to happen? You know, it's, it's not going to happen if you pray hard. And so I see that. Uh, religion has, and, and I mean, lots of people have written about this, like Friedrich Nietzsche uh, wrote about, uh, you know, Christianity and, and uh, how it's the slave religion. And I can, I can relate to that much more now yeah, as an African, uh, when I see, you know, how uh, Christianity has just taken a stranglehold on people and it's become, people have become so uh, obsessive about Christianity uh, and if we look at Christianity, especially the roots of this modern uh, Rhema type, uh, you know, evangelical Christianity, it's like 
had the perfect marriage with capitalism in, in the USA, you know, where they baked together this, this uh, neuro-linguistic program that they use and they, uh, you know, they, they created this formula of music and uh, hype it up with these songs and then hype it down and then uh, let's play this. Yeah, you know, and then, and they're really able to induce a, a, a very powerful emotional, a, emotional, yeah, and and so they they and they able to replicate this, so you know that that they able to induce these powerful emotions, and then people feel that oh, that's God, that's Jesus, but it's it's not all religions claim can lay claim to the claim to have those the spiritual experiences, but it's just purely a function of, of and even and, um, and what you want. even further than that, like if you think about like, and lots of people may you know think I'm being funny or whatever when I'm saying this, but like especially in Africa where we, you know, we were given this Bible and stuff and told to be, you know, what's the main principles that you always hear in your house? So when you go into a colored house, it's always something about the love of money is the root of evil. Um, stay humble, yes. be yes, whatever. Yes, yes. And that's why so many of us never aspire to greatness or never aspire to have, or, you know, you don't, you don't respect money. You don't respect property because it's like, oh, yeah. no, that's the devil stuff. I yeah, but that's, that's what Friedrich like, Nietzsche know? writes about. He says that uh, Christianity has made uh, virtues out of these human frailties and things that we, like meekness is, is exalted above courage. Uh, it's better to forgive than to fight than to, or, or seek justice. Yeah, it's uh, better you know, to do that when the, when the turn, turn the other unit. cheek, you know, yeah. rather than getting justice and that, and that kind I of mean, thing. the so, slave master takes the diamonds and the golds exactly. and Allah and just leaves you with four call and, you know, genocide happens 100%. and you get talked about and yeah. you know what I'm saying? And and that's why we're so uh, conquerable as as a people now. You know that, that we've already been conquered spiritually and otherwise economically. South America, just everything well, about us. you know. So America, it's, it's like the perfect. Uh, I mean, and if you look at Christianity, it's now merged with with white supremacy, and it's now the perfect vehicle with which we we will never challenge white adequately challenge white supremacy if we don't remove these shackles on our brain and our thinking. Um, and that's you, that's why you find that other places that that aren't as uh, Christian centric are much more liberated from the drudgery of white supremacy uh, than Africa was, because Africa was wholesale Christianized, and even South America wholesale Christian uh, Christianized, you know. And and so, but whereas you look at Japan and you look at China and the East, uh, where they they much they don't have the same deferential respect to whiteness and. Uh, and that that we do, um, you know. No, so just, I, I just I just find I look, that that quite quite an interesting. Thing. But don't don't get me wrong. Like there is a place for these things. Like with religion and stuff. Like I've seen where, I mean, drugs are always have always been a big thing in our communities. And I've seen how yes. like you know people who have become now they've gone off the drugs and they become Christian or they become Muslim, and they've turned their their lives around because of this this routine or this this methodology that they can follow and ascribe to and but then in the same breath those same people will this be the same ones judging you when you smoke in your zola oh yeah you. but look there is there is still a place for these things you know what i mean like for people to kind of find some sort of i don't know solace or peace within themselves and i mean i believe every person did you ever see the movie dogma with um in Africa. Oh yeah absolutely loved, loved it, loved it. Yeah. and in the end like you and basically for time said, it was quite controversial yeah, but I mean, at the end, this is as long as you have an idea, you know, as long as someone has their own kind of idea and you, you know, you're ethical, you're a good person, you do unto others, then, you know, like, what, it's it's the same thing, like, what is your belief? Why can't I be friends with you because you believe something different? Why can't I be friends with you because you're homosexual? Why can't I be friends with you because you're bloody transvestite? Whatever. How does that have a bearing on me as a person? <laughs> And that is something yeah. that we struggle to overcome, you know. But but like that, that's the problem with with the you know uh, freezing your your ideology or your your moral stance in time, because like that, and that's what that's what all religions do is that oh this is wrong and you know we've we it says so in our holy text therefore it's going to be wrong perpetually so the stoning homosexuals is going to be wrong forever. Uh, but then ultimately, what you find that happens in secular society is that. Uh, secular uh, lobbyists and, and, and secular thinkers will challenge these things. And you'll find that when laws get, get, get passed, they aren't passed uh, based on, I mean, there's no, very few countries that are theocratic and that, that are run purely along religious lines. 
Uh, but you'll find that much of the, the advancement that we've made as society is because of, of uh, secular humanism rather than, you know, theocratic interpretations of, of scripture and, and, you know, us doggedly sticking to uh, certain rights and wrongs, even, even the, the, the Catholic Church now. And this just speaks to how man-made it all is, because there's so much fluidity in the, 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 the scripture and, and, the, and its interpretation. Uh, like the, the Catholic Church now says homosexuality is fine, you know, and before that was like a mortal sin, you know, they, and so, but they've changed their mind. And yeah. because a group of men decided, hey, you know what, uh, the public opinion is turning against this, uh, you know, we are now looking like we're stuck in the mud, like we stuck in the past, so maybe we should change our position. And boom, 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 after many years of lobbying and, and social activism and public uh, ex expressions of, of malcontents, now the Catholic Church has woken up. You know yeah, what I'm saying? So these things happen. So it's uh, as, as much as we think that it it's, was written by the hand of God and it's unchangeable, all religions are being shaped by secular society. Well, you see, you see what happens in places like, look at the Middle East now, where you know, they, they basically run on Sharia law and stuff like that. And yes. they, they stuck to change, but then you got all these rich um, Middle Eastern people or Arabs or whatever coming over to London and basically just going on a rampage, bro, because they can't do it in their own country. So they yes. come and they just yes. go before you. And <laughs> like I've had a few clients, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from first hand experience here. Yeah. Like, you know, and then you go back and then you love your pious existence and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you there. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing about being an atheist is like an extremist atheist is somebody that has a, a large library of books. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's like the extent of, of, the ext of, of extremism or, or that talks harshly on Facebook and, and just shares lots of memes, uh, you know, anti-religious, <laughs> anti which I'm guilty of doing. Uh, and I've, I, I know that my atheism, uh, you know, it annoys people and they... Uh, I've lost friends as a result of this. I've been kicked out of family events. And so it has I can imagine. shaped my life. I mean, I've been, I, I've been ostracized just for my left field views on Christianity and life and colored and black people and stuff. So imagine you now going to a, a braai or something. And yeah, and I, I'm the, unashamed of it. The no, I'm, I'm unashamed of it. So it's, it's part of my identity. It, it's, it's who I am. Um, and it's something I, I embrace. I think it's made me a better person. I'm better for being an atheist than, than not. So my so, uncle, uh, one of my, my, my mother's eldest brother, he was also like atheist as well. And, but he's found, uh, he's been uh, studying philosophy and Sanskrit for the last 10 or 15 years or so. But he is also one of those people that they, nobody just, they just don't get him. Like, you know, I think a lot of people just don't, it's just like, what's wrong with you? But I, I have an amazing relationship with him. You know, we chat, yeah. we talk, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's interesting. No, it's uh, I, I, and I, if, I, if I look at where the where the world is going now, um, I think that some more atheism would be better because uh, atheists have a respect for science fundamentally, most of them. Um, and I'm not sure. To, I mean, not all athe atheists are very different, but I just find that the atheists that I've encountered um, arrive there through. Uh, you know, assessing facts and evidence, and it's quite a journey. People, nobody just wakes up. Oh, I'm going to be an atheist. Uh, you know, it's actually a realization, and, and it's a long process to actually arrive at the point where you know what? I don't believe there's enough evidence for for God, and therefore I will not. I don't believe in God for the same reason I don't believe in um, you know the tooth fairy. Okay, just because there's a lot of text, ancient texts written that describe this God, there is no evidence. This God has never been revealed. In, in the, the best laboratories in the world. And it's not because scientists or, or, or you know, academics are not looking for this God. Uh, it's just that this God, there's no evidence whatsoever. That, and if you have to prove that there's a God, you'll win the Nobel Prize, you know what I'm saying? But the way the world is going now, we think that this is a spare planet. And, and I'm very uh, offended by the, uh, the belief now in, in, a, in an afterlife, because I just think that it cheapens this life and it makes us very, disrespectful to our natural resources because we think that uh, oh this is just a practice life this is just a you know it's a, it's a it's a testing ground or whatever and we'll go to paradise afterwards and so we don't give the necessary care to the environment we don't think about uh, longevity or sustainability or, or anything like that and it's very very selfish um, 
and very unnecessary, but it's also very difficult to undo because people have so bought into this idea of an afterlife that uh, this life is, is quite negligible and for, for them. So that's the, an unspoken of side effect of, of, of religious belief. Now, I, I, I completely, I mean, I, I get that completely. How do you then, how do you feel about like, cause in um, a lot of the stuff that I read about, especially in Eastern philosophy and yoga, they talk about um, it being a science because it's basically a process of understanding yourself. You do this and you, you achieve this. So you do yoga, your body will have these effects. You eat these foods, you'll have these things. And they basically refer to inner engineering in that sense, in a, in a yogic sense as a science. You know, I mean, there's many of these people or teachers that aren't, specifically involved with all the gods and the deities and you know those types of stuff and more just in terms of like uh in, you should have, you should check out um i don't know if you've heard of Sadhguru. um yeah mm -hmm. Sadhguru. he his talks are always very interesting because he relates he can relate to anybody and he's like a, a guru but it's not about the religion or the gods and whatever. It's about engineering yourself. Do you know what I mean? There are processes. Hundred percent. I mean, I'm. I'm. Uh, it doesn't mean that that you need to subscribe to supernatural beliefs yes. uh, and and magical thinking to actually do this. This is actually very good. Uh, I believe in self mastery and you know self discipline and improve self improvement, eating well, exercise. I don't do these things very often, like the exercising thing, especially. I have lots of room for improvement there, but definitely eating well, you'll start feeling better. Uh, you know, you you won't have all these little ailments that you have. You so in terms of your your existential well being and and uh, you know your holistic well being, then all these things, all those ancient wisdoms were self evident that you didn't need divine uh, in. Uh, uh, some divine exactly. uh, message on a tablet to tell you that hey, eating well uh, is good for the good for the body, good for the mind. Exercise is good for the body. Good, you know what I'm saying? You didn't need it. That was actually quite easily uh, discernible, and and uh, you know people could arrive at that logical conclusion. So I I fully support like yoga. I mean that's physical, that's exercise, that's eating, good eating. I mean obviously those things are gonna are gonna manifest in uh, materially in 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 the way a person lives their life and and what they're able to achieve. That that self discipline, that self mastery, those are critically important things. And I I do that, and I'm an atheist, right? And but you know I don't I don't I'm I'm not against following ancient texts for for those particular kind of things. Where I draw the line, where what I I. I'm not very fond of is magical thinking. You know, yeah. I just think that if we don't have a scientific basis for things that to inform the way we respond to pandemics, for example, the way we go about, uh, you know, just treating science with with, with more respect and and. Uh, no, I, I get that completely, bro. Like yeah. especially because, like, I don't know about you, but when we were growing up, it was like science was like also a negative. It was a negative thing around it, and that's why I. For me, in terms of my process and my thing, I like, I've always felt science and philosophy like coexist in my world. Like when people said, one person said the Big Bang, God said, let there be light. Like, you know, for me, it's always kind of coexisted and I've always found ways to, you know, like find just, yeah, because I mean, it's all, it's all people's thoughts and ideas at the end of the day. It's how I choose. Yes, to but, but with science, it's, it's evidence. It needs to be proven, right? You know, you got to have data to, you can't just say whatever you want to say and oh, a voice came to me and, you know, and you speak very poetically uh, with your Bronze Age uh, goat herder uh, vocabulary. And now you're describing the start of the universe and the ultimate laws of, of nature. And when you barely, you, you don't even know what an atom is, or you, you don't even know uh, what the speed of light is, or what a pla the Planck length is, or whatever. You don't know any of these basic tenets of, of modern physics and modern science, but you're making these glorious, grand, uh, just uh, declarations about the origin of the universe and how it all came together in seven days, and come on. <laughs> you see, like for me, I, 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 that, I do believe that things can be inspired because there's many, like, there's many things that, that you can't quantify or explain. You can't explain love. You can't explain, you know, you can't That's explain. a common refrain. That's a common refrain. Um, I mean, love, we got a pretty good idea what that it's, it's. Have you ever taken any form of psychedelics or mushrooms or ayahuasca or anything like that? And this thing's going to be on, uh, it's going to be on YouTube. Uh, yeah. I, I have, I, I have, yeah. No, I have, I have. I'll be honest. Uh, and deliberately because I actually wanted to, 
have something approximating. I felt that I was so devoid of, of any spiritual experiences. And I do remember having actual spiritual experiences. Well, in hindsight, that was my brain just on a buzz and a high and a particular plane. What did you plane. do? Mushrooms or something? Mushrooms. Yeah, okay. I, I, did, I did mushrooms. And it was, it was luck, huh? You know, I liked the, the buzz it gave and, uh, you know, the, the, the colors. colors, they get brighter and, you know, the, the shapes that are moving and everything. And it was, it was luck, huh? you know? Oh, no. And I, I did it in a very structured environment, wanted to, to try it. So I went to my white, my white friend, Adam. I was like, hey, Brew, Adam. <laughs> you know a guy. I know a guy. I know a guy. Charles, just pull in, Brew. The next thing you know. <laughs> oh, Adam got, Adam got like a whole Denny's uh, lab here. What, what do you want? <laughs> and I'm like, bro, I'll, take it. I'll just take that shot. So, uh, you know, and like holy damn bro um it wasn't exactly the experience that that i wanted i thought it was gonna be a lot more powerful and and so maybe you need to I try suppose are, you need to try uh, i i imagine i imagine they are higher level uh yeah there's a I dmt done, I or something i i haven't done any of that but i mean it's it's uh for me it's just the brain and and uh, i'm i'm very open to to those kind of experiences you know they can unlock uh different parts of the brain that we neglect um and and you know, we deny ourselves these certain human experiences. Life is is, is uh, difficult enough as it is. So if we can use natural, naturally occurring things to help us, you know, deal with the, the, the complexities of life, uh, I, I have no problems with that. It just so like, obviously um, needs to be done responsibly by adults. Uh, obviously, you've said that you, you know, you respect people, you respect the, um, you know, whatever their, their religious beliefs are, whatever they choose to believe. You also... You try to be as ethical as possible. You try to, you know, you know, do your best because you don't want um, other people to whatever come back and do the, the opposite to you. So then would you say that like, because just gathering from what you've said, like, um, would you say that you limit your life experience because you have to explain everything? Because you're saying you don't like things that are too magical and stuff. And I understand, I mean, you've obviously been through a lot in your life and you've, you've been through some serious experiences and, and like real trauma. So it's hard to obviously believe in fantasy and magic and stuff. Whereas someone who may have had like a perfect life and, you know, they're going on holidays to, to wherever and, you know, their life is just amazing because of their parents. They might have a bit more of them. They might love Disney, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I love fantasy. I love fantasy. Political? I, I love fantasy, like fantasy movies. No, I'm not just, movies. not just fantasy and super, I'm just talking about like the magic of like being in a beautiful place and feeling this aura or presence of something. I, I like, feel that. And I, I, did try, I, I, wow. And I think about the history of it and I think how did this place arrive? And I think about so what the do you geology think of like, the region. How do, you, how do you explain that? Like, yes, you look at the geology, you look at the nature, you, you smell the you know, the fresh air, especially, I mean, where you are, I mean, when it rains, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Outside. This place is quite amazing. You know, I mean, even, um, yeah. No, I think being an, being an atheist just has given me a greater appreciation for, for these things that you, you can't, you don't need a, uh, a divine vocabulary or a spiritual vocabulary or a scriptural vocabulary to be able to confer value in these things or, in, or, or you know, derive value from from these uh, physical phenomena, it's uh, the, quite the opposite. I feel that the, the, the vocabulary that we used uh, and that, that it's just that cascaded physical, through time. Is that physical phenom phenomena, like when you're experiencing, when you go to this amazing place, so you go to the top of a mountain and you get this feeling, which is not really something that can be, you know, explained scientifically, what, what do you call that? Because I mean, whether you choose to believe in God or not or whatever, there is a profound sense of being overwhelmed or humbled by maybe nature or, or mother earth or whatever whether you want to choose to like explain i'm not that quick to to ascribe things to supernatural origin uh you know but maybe that... it's not supernatural maybe it's something that's within you it i mean it could be everywhere it, it doesn't have to be because like you don't have to describe it in terms of a divine whatever scripture or you know supernatural whatever but would you say that there is something like something that that you know you just can't explain? 
Um, those moments of few and far between, like, you know, those moments that literally take your breath away. So maybe I'm living a, a very boring life because I don't, you know, get put into those positions too often where I'm climbing top of Kilimanjaro and uh, beating my chest and I uh, look at this. Uh, I, I just, I try to, if I do get those kind of inclinations, I'm like, whoa, this is, this is, I, it, my, my thinking now is just super logical and it's just, everything just needs to make sense. Everything, I just, that's just the way I've that's, I've that's what I'm my asking mind. you. I mean, that, that's my original question is like, do you feel that that is limiting your experience of life? Because I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I'm in the pursuit of those kind of experiences. I mean, I'm open to those kind of experiences. If you tell me travel, uh, you got a backpack, there's a place we can drive, boom, I'm there. Just uh, can put in a leave in right now, I'm there. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, I like those, those kind of experiences. Uh, it's just that I, I, I process them differently than uh, when I did and, and when, I, when I had uh, as a Christian. Um, you know, it just... Uh, I'm just asking because, like, say you read something... And then the minute it sounds too supernatural, fantastic, you're like, ah, oh, I could say I believe this. I'm not going to do No, no, I can still appreciate the, the artistry of it, the, 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 the verbal sophistry, the, 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 you know, the, the intellectual uh, angle. I can, I can appreciate the creativity. I can appreciate all of that. Uh, it doesn't mean that it, it's, it's, it's hollow and null and void and discardable because it, it, it lacks scientific merits. No, I think that you know art and, and creativity and and, and beauty and and or these things that that are difficult for science to to ascribe value to and measure are part of perfectly viable as as facets of reality that uh you know we, we humans grapple with but it doesn't detract from the ability to be something's beauty is not uh heightened or lessened by my ability to scientifically describe it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's still beautiful objectively with yeah. or without my vocabulary or anybody's vocabulary. It is, that is just beautiful objectively on any level. That is what it is. So just because I don't understand it or I'm not able to fully define it or pigeonhole it or whatever, doesn't mean it's more or less beautiful. It is what it is. Um, and so I, I try not to, you know, be, I can be a bore. I mean, I always like, don't like coming to, coming to my posy anymore because I shoot them down with my arguments and uh, <laughs> I got few, I got so few friends now. Uh, bro, I call you know, me, don't I, I, like, <laughs> I like a good debate anytime, bro, you can call me. <laughs> I, mean, um, I just need to get the, get to get my black labels lined up, you know what I'm saying? Because that's how we do it these days, bro. Eh? Just a couple of blackies. A couple bro. of beers, Zoom, yeah, and hey, bro, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could chat. <laughs> I'm down for that. Yeah, no, no. I mean, like, I, I, I love, like, for me, it's more just the thing about um, just understanding your, your way of thought because through these podcasts, like, everyone that I've spoke to, I mean, I've spoken to a Krishna monk on a few episodes before you. Yeah, yeah. And I I'm mean, trying to catch was, up on all your episodes, man. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah no, no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's cool, bro. Take your time. But, like, mm -hmm. literally, I'm just trying to understand because for me, it's, it's been such a eye opening and awakening experience, bro. Like, obviously I know, you know, I know of you, I know what you've done, but now after speaking to you, it's like, I feel like a deeper understanding and connection as to you as a person, not necessarily about the things that you've done because everybody can do stuff and be, you know, commended and whatever and stuff for their work. But like actually going through things as a person, is something I can, I, you know, I, I prefer to relate yeah. to a bit more. It's, it's a bit more, no, I respect it feels that. more real to me, you know what I mean? No, 100%. I mean, uh, I, and I suppose that the digital space has kind of uh, eviscerated that society of those, those natural, uh, you know, organic interactions that, that we used to have. Um, so I know that people do uh, pretend on, on social media to be something that they're not. But I, I always try to retain authenticity. And, and so that when people meet me, uh, you know, in real life, you know, it's, it's not a far cry from the, the person I've put, I've put forward uh, through whatever social media chat I'm on. So yeah, authenticity is, is important to me. It's like, why would I be a fake? It doesn't make sense. It's I mean, there, there is there is obviously place and time, especially in entertainment, to put on a costume or a mask. Or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? that, that I get. That I get, yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, all things and purposes, yeah. the reason I started this was yeah. literally to just get to know people, man. 
I mean, no, shocking. such a sick, a sick journey so far. Like I've chatted to so many different people. But um, yeah, we will, we will definitely catch up again. So what I'm trying to do is like um, maybe in a, you know, a couple of months or a year, I'll call you back or whatever we can catch up. Hundreds, bro. Hopefully I've got, I'm in a different place. I'll have a different background. I'll be like, uh, you know, the, the, I'll, hopefully I'll have a bookshelf. You know, I'll have like the, <laughs> oh, I, no. I'll have a book, you know, the, the, the requisite bookshelf. Yeah. You know, it's not a proper Zoom thing. Chief yeah. is sort of so using all these big words. What, 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 where's his bookshelf? <laughs> you know, pray ah, it's got, uh, looks like he's got a, <laughs> a nice flower um, in the background there. Yeah, there is a flower. There is a flower. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the home decor is still being taken care of. But those are, those are on, on borrowed time. Those are on borrowed time. It's just that I don't have anything else to replace them with right now. <laughs> But yeah, they they on borrowed time. <laughs> Are you um? Do you have any socials or anything like? I mean, if there is anything you can give me, I can share it to people. Um, on Twitter, your... Charles underscore Ash, uh, and yeah, I'm on I'm on Facebook, Charles Ash. I saw there was a few of your stand ups on YouTube. I'll I'll post the links to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that um, was uh, some old school stuff. And then if you, there's also like my dealing with autism ad that that uh, I did. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I but there's a that one, but I'll check it out. I'll, 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 I'll just send the link. It was yeah. a promo video that I did with Autism South Africa to, to promote that. And then that was like immediately after we filmed that, like two days later, we left Joburg and, you know, we came to to here yeah, and then, yeah, nice. the wheels came off. Bro, much love yeah. to you, man. Love, peace. And, no, thanks uh, for this, my bro. I appreciate it, my bro. Thank you so much. Hey, your picture somewhere disappeared. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> like... uh, sorry about that. I, I, hate the, I hate the space bar there. I hate the space bar. <laughs> But thank you so much. I appreciate your time, bro. I appreciate your energy. I appreciate um, your insights as well, man. I'm sure people will relate. Oh, shut my food. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot. And um, care, this man. has been The Other Side of the Sun. I'm the Solar Kid. Charles Ash. Peace out. I will.